Now pain can become chronic, it can become long term. And we normally say that chronic pain is pain that persists for, well you can make something up just as well as I can. But what most of the textbooks say is pain that persists for more than three months. It's a fairly arbitrary time period. But if pain is persisting for more than three months it can become chronic. And in that case the pain is serving no useful purpose. An acute pain warns us of tissue damage and it performs a useful purpose but pain can become chronic. And one of the reasons for this is the neuroplasticity particularly in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord but probably in other parts of the brain as well that there can actually be changes to neuronal anatomy and physiology as a result of pain. What's going on here? The pain has become chronic. So how does this come about? Well as we know we have afferent fibres. Here's the old cell body that we know so well now of the sensory neuron. Goes into the spinal cord and it will synapse with a secondary neuron. Secondary neuron there. And this is in the dorsal horn of the spinal cord. And we know that what happens is neurotransmitters are released from the presynaptic neuron substance P or glutamate or whatever it is, diffuse across the synaptic gap, stimulate the prosynaptic membrane and the pain impulse goes up to the brain. That happens, we know that. But the chemical transmitter to get from the presynaptic membrane to the postsynaptic membrane diffuses. It's simple diffusion. You remember diffusion. The tendency for substances to intermingle until their concentrations become equal throughout. Simple diffusion. And this means that some things diffuse, some of the chemical neurotransmitter will diffuse out of the gap as well. So there can be diffusion of the neurotransmitter. So especially if there's a lot of pain going through, then there's going to be diffusion out. And in the central nervous system we have another group of cells as well as neurons. And the other group of cells are called the glial cells. So the glial cells are cells present in the central nervous system that aren't neurons. They're glial supporting cells. So here's a glial cell. And we used to think they were just there to kind of provide a bit of support, a bit of scaffolding general support to the nerve cells. But what happens is that when the glial cells are exposed to neurotransmitters that will these neurotransmitters can actually activate the genes in the glial cells and the genes in the glial cells can be activated by the neurotransmitters and they can stimulate the glial cells to produce chemical products that are excreted from the glial cells. And I guess these are a kind of cytokine really, because what they do is they communicate with the afferent pain pathway. And these chemicals produced by the activated glial cell will actually stimulate more neurotransmitter to be released from here. You could call these precocious glial cell proteins. They're just a nuisance. Because they cause more chemical transmitter. That's going to cause more pain. The whole thing is the pain transmission is going to be increased. But at the same time, the increase in neurotransmitters is going to diffuse to the glial cells and that's going to cause even more DNA activation, more genomic activation of these precocious glial cell proteins. 
That means more stimulation of the neurotransmitters. That means more pain. That means more stimulation of, you get the idea. It's a positive feedback loop, a vicious positive feedback loop, meaning the patient's getting humongous amounts of pain, huge amounts of pain in this afferent pathway. Pain that's generated in the spinal cord, not pain that's coming from tissue damage. So what do we do about this? Well, unfortunately, we have no specific treatments to get rid of these precocious glial cell products at the moment. We can treat it with local anaesthetics. We can treat it with systemic analgesics. We can treat it with psychological support and try and kind of break this vicious cycle. But of course, it's good to prevent this situation from happening in the first place. And even although this is not based on experimental trial data, most people believe that if we can reduce the amount of pain in the acute situation by giving analgesics, we can reduce the likelihood of this happening. So that means that analgesics are not purely symptomatic treatments, like I said before, although they are symptomatic treatments, but it means they're actually preventing the possible or reducing the likelihood of this chronic pain scenario from um, from developing because we don't want this vicious circle so treat your acute pains aggressively we don't want the patient to be in pain because they could be left with a lot of pain and this isn't that rare chronic pain syndromes Pains that persist for more than three months, many months, or even years or decades can affect, some figures say, around about 10% of patients after trauma or 10% of patients after surgery. The pain can persist when the tissue damage has resolved. So prevent that with good analgesics. If it has developed, treat it with local and systemic analgesics. Treat it with cognitive behavioural therapy, psychological techniques, use your full interpersonal skills and try and break this vicious circle. But ideally prevent it from happening in the first place. So in this context, pain, chronic pain can be considered to be a disease. <laughs>